Would you please speak to the differences between OCPD and OCD? Absolutely. And this is probably could be a talk in and of itself. So one of the things that I'm really looking for with OCPD is I'm looking for a pervasive pattern that exists across interactions, including social interactions, interpersonal interactions. I'm not typically seeing a specific stimulus. The other thing that's important is remember compulsions are going to be a key criterion for OCD, which we may not necessarily see to the same extent or to the same magnitude in OCPD. How would you distinguish between OCD and illness anxiety disorder? Excellent question and really, really difficult to distinguish here. So one of the things for me in terms of separating these is again, looking at time course. So typically for OCD, I'm looking at when the disorder emerged and I'm looking for something to have emerged earlier on. I'm also looking at those comorbidity patterns that we talked about. Um, and I'm really looking at, at the general phenomenology of the two disorders. Again, this is where we can go back to that Sesame Street song and think about which one of these is not like the other. We know that they have very distinct risk factors and that they have different courses. Do you use or recommend pharmacogenetic testing in patients with OCD and many suboptimal SSRI trials? I think the person asking this question is trying to trick me. Because for some reason, they included the word suboptimal SSRI trials. Let's try to unpack that. So in terms of we can certainly have a patient who's treated with a very, very low dose of fluoxetine and has no 2D6, they can have side effects with a quote-unquote suboptimal trial. This is where sometimes just thinking about dose in and of itself is problematic. I would say, actually, I'm going to change the question because I can. So if we were looking at a patient that had had optimized trials, so they'd not responded to 200 milligrams of sertraline or 150 milligrams of sertraline, they've not responded to 60 milligrams of fluoxetine or even 40 milligrams of fluoxetine, I would actually get pharmacogenetic testing here. The other thing is that even in the absence of pharmacogenetic testing, we can use clinical pharmacology to guide what we're doing. For example, that patient that I mentioned who had no response at 200 milligrams of sertraline, and let's say he or she didn't have side effects at 200 milligrams of sertraline, and I'm trying to consider my next SSRI, I am not going to pick escitalopram or citalopram as my next SSRI. Why? Well, they're both metabolized primarily by 2C19, which is the primary enzyme metabolizing sertraline. So I'm probably going to pick something that's metabolized through a different pathway. So again, even in the absence of having the pharmacogenetic testing, knowing about pharmacogenetics can help us make informed decisions.